Hi, everybody. I want to start today by sharing with you four words that were virtually unthinkable even five years ago. The end of AIDS. Now, I've been working in HIV programming for about 15 years now, and it hasn't been until very recently that a lot of really big people have been talking about an AIDS-free generation. Everybody from religious leaders to presidents, policymakers, and celebrities wearing orange sunglasses. <laughs> Everyone's talking about the end of AIDS for the first time, and this is amazing. This is truly exciting time to be fighting against HIV. Not only that, but there are all kinds of people who are willing to fund HIV programming and research. These are just some of the biggest players in the game right now. But this includes countries, organizations, bilateral, multilateral organizations. The US Global Development Labs just recently pledged $1 billion to fighting infectious diseases, including HIV. So all this money is going to fund all kinds of things, day-to-day -day programming, on-the-ground implementation of HIV services. But it's also going to fund a lot of new technologies to fight HIV. This is pretty cool. There are all these new portable diagnostic machines so that you can place them in rural villages in far-flung Africa, and even health facilities with no electricity can test for HIV. There's more effective medications out there now, so HIV is no longer a death sentence. You can live for 20, 30, 40, 50 years by managing and effectively medicating HIV. Vaccine development, a lot of this is going on actually here in Seattle, but people are, create, are on the road to create a vaccine against HIV that you can give to children so that they will never have to face the possibility of being infected with HIV. I mean, this is amazing stuff, guys. There's also a lot of research going on with male circumcision. This is kind of interesting because this isn't actually a new technology. I mean, I believe this stuff was going on in the Bible. But male circumcision has been shown um, through research, a lot of it conducted by the University of Washington even, to show that you can effectively prevent the transmission of HIV by 50% or more in some populations. And above all, I think that we see this in all facets of our lives, there's a belief that smartphones are going to come out and save the day, right? And actually, you know, they might. <laughs> they really might in HIV. You can actually plug in these little gizmos into cell phones, and you can turn a smartphone into a portable diagnostic machine. I mean, you could test for HIV with a phone. Who knew? You can also use cell phones to connect patients and providers via text messaging. So a doctor could text his patient and say, you know, don't forget to take your medication, or don't forget that you have a, a medical coming up next week. Make sure to come in for it because we need to test your blood levels and things like this. So all of this technology, I think we can all agree, this technology is great. This is amazing. This has a potential to save millions and millions of lives. But I want to turn this question around just a little bit today and ask a slightly different version of it. Is all of this technology what we need? And is it what we need the most? Now, these are some of the top 10 killers in low-income countries. Some of them are infectious diseases like HIV, malaria, tuberculosis. Other of these are related to health system issues. So these are things like access to health care. When you think about complications that arise in pregnancy and childbirth, a lot of times this is because people don't have access to effective prenatal care, or they can't get into the health facility in time to deliver their child. So there are lots, of, um, lots and lots of preventable deaths that are related to these areas. But the thing about most of these killers is we kind of know what to do about them. We have medications that can cure malaria and tuberculosis. We're getting to the point where we can effectively manage HIV through medication, as well as through monitoring throughout people's lives, you know, about how to manage your HIV infection. One of the most effective technologies to combat malaria is actually bed nets. And this technology has been around for decades. When you go to health facilities in developing countries, this is something that I do a lot. I talk to a lot of health workers and a lot of clinics, both urban sites and really rural villages. And I ask them all the time, you know, what do you need to fight these killers? And you know what they have never told me? They have never told me that they need a smartphone app to fight malaria or to fight HIV. The number one thing that these folks are going to tell me that they need, more people. 
They need more health workers. And these are just some of the health workers that I've talked to in Sudan and Cote d'Ivoire, Mozambique and Timor-Leste. And each one of them will tell me that the thing that they need the most right now are more people that are trained and qualified to work right by their side because their patient workload is overwhelming. So what's going on here? Where is this problem the worst? Now this map is from the WHO from 2006, so it's a little bit old now, but I think it'll still give you the point of what I'm trying to say, which is the countries in red are the ones that are facing a critical shortage of health workers. Now the WHO defines a critical shortage as 2.3 health workers per 1,000 people in the population, which is kind of a hard thing, I think, to really conceptualize, right? What is 2.3 health workers in the population? I don't, I don't know what that means either. So I want to kind of clarify it a little bit more, but to do so I'm going to need to show you a graph and some numbers. And I don't really want to show you numbers. I don't want to spend all my 15 minutes up here showing you a bunch of numbers on the big screen behind me. I'd much rather be showing you pictures of cute babies. Because I mean, I come across a lot of cute babies in my work. I mean, look at this one. Oh my god, I have so many pictures of cute babies. I can keep on going all day, but I won't. I'm going to show you these numbers because I think that they're really compelling and I think that they're going to illustrate better than anything else I could possibly say today how bad this problem is. So I was thinking about doctors and how many doctors do you need in a population to deliver health and how many doctors are there in the world? I chose a population of about 25 million people in a country because 25 million happens to be the population of three places that I care a lot about. One is Cote d'Ivoire, where, as Ben mentioned, I've been working um, with my organization, Health Alliance International, for a long time now in Cote d'Ivoire, and that's actually where all those cute babies came from, I could add. Another place is um, Mozambique, which is another country where HAI has programming. And the third place I care a lot about is Texas, which isn't really a country, but I'm from Texas, and I can tell you Texans like to believe that they're their own country, so I put them up there as well. Turns out that Australia, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen have about the same number of people, give or take a million on either side. So I threw them up here just for comparison. So let's get going. Australia has about 82,000 doctors in their entire country, just doctors. Now, if you want to go back to that WHO recommendation of how many health workers are needed in a population, they said 2.3 health workers per 1,000 people. Well, this number of doctors comes out to be about four doctors per 1,000 people, and that doesn't even count all the nurses, and midwives, and physicians assistants, and all these other amazing people that staff hospitals and clinics. So Australia's looking pretty good, but it's kind of hard to say. We, we might want to compare it to a few other places. So let's go to Texas. Texas has about 69,000 doctors, one of whom delivered me into this world, so I'm very grateful to that one particular doctor. So they also kind of look pretty good. They're about in the same range as Australia, and that's just for one state. But here's where it gets interesting. Check out Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, I don't think anyone would argue is a poor country. They have less than half of the doctors of Texas. Yemen is still even worse. They have only less than 5,000 doctors in their whole country. But even Yemen looks like a medical paradise when you compare it to what my friends in Cote d'Ivoire and Mozambique are looking at. Mozambique had, in 2011, 1,268 doctors for the entire country. And this is a country that was facing a prevalence of eight, an HIV prevalence of 20% or more in places. That's less than 2% of the doctors that, are, that the state of Texas has alone. So what's going on here? How come the Africa region is facing 24% of the global disease burden, but they have fewer than 3% of the health workers in the entire world? So I could go all day about why there aren't enough health workers in this world. There's a lot of really interesting research going on in this area because I think it's a question that a lot of people are really concerned about, right? But we can boil it down into two main factors of why there aren't enough healthcare workers in the places that need them the most. One is what we like to call push factors. So these are things that push people out of the public sector. They push people out of the health facilities that they might have gotten their first job at. And this is related to the fact that health facilities in developing countries can be pretty crummy places to work. I mean, I've gone to health facilities all over the place and sometimes they don't have electricity or running water. There's lab technicians that don't even have a microscope. So if you can't really do your job well, the job you've been trained to do, a lot of times you're going to leave that place and look to work somewhere else. So those are what we call push factors. 
The other side of this coin is what we call pull factors. And these are things that lure health workers out of the public sector and into greener, greener pastures, right? So this has to do with um, issues that we call, we call brain drain. So it's when trained, qualified health workers leave their health facilities and go either to a different country or they might go to the private sector where they're going to get a higher salary. You know, we see a lot of times that entire countries are implicated in this process. So, you know, nurses that are trained in the Philippines might get actively recruited by hospitals in Great Britain to come and fill their health worker shortages, leaving the country of the Philippines with no qualified health workers. So that's what we call pull factors. Now I've taken you on a bit of a roller coaster here, right? I've been like, hey, we're gonna solve AIDS within our lifetime, look at all these cool technologies. And then I've been telling you that, hey, even with the best technologies, they're pretty useless if you don't have any people on the other end of the line being able to implement some of these cool smartphone apps and portable diagnostic machines and everything else. If you have an empty health facility, no one's gonna be able to use that life-saving technology to save lives. But there is something I believe that we can do about it. And this is something that my organization, Health Alliance International, has been working pretty hard on. And there's a lot of people working really hard on this problem right now. How can we, fill the, the, how can we fix the problem of not being enough health workers in the places that need them the most? One thing we can do is train more health workers, right? We can take some of the funds that are, being go that are going right now to fund uh, technology development and use them to support countries to train more health workers in their own countries. So even if people do decide to leave the country or leave the public sector, there will still be a bigger initial supply and more people will end up staying in the, health in the public health sector. So that's one thing we can do is train more people. We can also improve conditions at health facilities. So remember those push factors I was telling you about? Why don't we just improve conditions at the health facilities? Make sure that there's electricity and running water. Make sure that there's tools available so that people can actually do their jobs. These ladies here are actually, um, they're pretty amazing. This, this woman here is a midwife in a rural health facility, and she is the only one in 50 kilometers that's able to deliver babies, right? And she showed me around her health facility, and she said, you know, Julia, what I need right now are just more people here, and I need to be able to know that I have a bed here so that when women do come to deliver at this health facility, facility they're gonna be feeling comfortable. They're gonna have trust in me and trust in this health facility. So we can improve conditions, working conditions to entice those health workers to stay. Now the last thing that I'm gonna propose is that we eliminate some of these pull factors. And here's where we, as the United States, as well as other rich countries, are accountable. We do actively recruit health workers from developing countries without providing any kind of innovative strategies to help those countries deal with the resulting shortfall in health workers. So I think that if we hold rich countries and NGOs accountable at the highest policy levels and make them commit to not destroying health, health systems across the world, I think that that's another thing that we can actively do to, in, to improve this critical shortage of health workers. So I don't want you to leave here today thinking that I think that technology is terrible. I don't. I think technology is amazing. I think that this technology that we're developing here in Seattle and around the world can truly save lives, can eliminate HIV within our lifetimes. I truly believe that. And that makes me go to work every single day. But I also believe with every cell in my body that technology needs people to implement it. And as we're putting all of this time and energy and resource and innovation into developing gizmos, we also need to put that same level of effort into supporting health workers and supporting countries to grow their own health workforces. If we are serious about the end of AIDS, and I am very serious about the end of AIDS, we do need to support these people on the other end and not just gadgets and gizmos. Thank you very much.